that's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Good. Uh, over to you, Jack. That's great. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, before I start my talk, I want to ask you a question. How many of you here are familiar with or have an understanding of circular economy or cradle to cradle? Is this something you're familiar with? Oh, wow. Okay. So I've got a lot of experts in the audience. Um, okay, so this set of slides, this presentation, I'm going to start with the big picture. I'm going to talk to you about cradle to cradle, circular economy, try and explain why we are where we are and why the building industry, uh, the built environment, the construction industry can take a big, big part in changing the way that we design and use buildings. So I want to give you an understanding of the concept of circular economy and cradle to cradle design, how they work together. Very importantly, the business drivers. Certainly from a manufacturer perspective, if you don't have a good business case, and it's true for architects, it's true for investors and contractors, then it's very difficult to change your business model. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what are the business drivers for change to a circular economy system. And then I'm going to talk about what that's meant for us as a ceiling manufacturer and how we've embraced the idea of cradle-to-cradle -cradle design in our product portfolio. So you'll see some case studies from Armstrong. And then we can take some questions at the end. So that's what I'm going to go through. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about Armstrong ceilings. We make the kind of things that you're sitting underneath, both in mineral and metal and wood and all sorts of other materials. And this is more the detail of the contents of the presentation this afternoon. So I want to try and define the problem because I don't think you can change any industrial system unless you really understand what is the start point what are the drivers of change? Why should we change what we're doing? And then more than that, I think the more important thing is the vision. Where are we trying to get to? Because again, you can't change anything if you don't have a vision of the future. And then we'll talk a little bit about circular economy, business case, and then into cradle-to-cradle -cradle design for buildings, and then the cradle-to-cradle -cradle product certification standard, which is where we come in with Armstrong. And you'll see here on the right, the cradle-to-cradle -cradle design, just so you can begin to think about this in terms of construction and buildings. We talk about material health. I'll explain that as we go through. We think about buildings that are designed for disassembly and reuse. In the past, we designed a building, we finished, and then we go. But now you've got to start to think about how you design for the building across its whole lifetime. To do that, you need value chain collaboration. You need the investors, the architects, the contractors, the installers, the manufacturers, the consultants to talk together because you're not going to get the buildings we want if you only talk in a linear fashion. We can talk a bit about value and we can talk a bit about what it means for the people inside the building because that's a key part of how we're going to make this change. So as I say, I talk a little bit about the big picture and then we'll zoom in to talk a little bit about uh, buildings specifically. You've seen images like this before. You've seen images like this for the last 20 or 30 years. And when we see these images, we go, yeah, 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 we get it, we get it. So why don't we just waste a little bit less? We'll make a little less pollution. Um, we'll use a little less coal, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. You start to think about this in a very different way. So this is our current industrial system. It's worked very well for a long time, but now I think, as you will agree, it's, it's unsustainable. So when you start to think about it, we put billions of tons of toxic material into the air, water and soil every year. We produce materials so dangerous that they require constant vigilance for future generations, nuclear waste, mercury, for example. We put a huge amount uh, of, we generate a lot of waste. We put materials that are, have real value, and we put them in holes in the ground forever. And it requires thousands of complex regulations, not to keep natural systems safe, but to keep them from poisoning us. When you think of all the regulations out there, most of it is to reduce the speed with which we and animals and trees and plants get destroyed. It's complete madness, really. And then we also measure productivity by how many people are not working. 
you know, we, uh, the way we think about this is kind of backwards. It's, it's, it's the wrong way. Um, and, of course, we create prosperity by cutting, the, cutting things down or digging things up and then eventually throwing them away. So, sure, that's worked, but I think you'll agree that that is now fundamentally unsustainable. And instead of thinking about this as uh, a pollution problem, we need to think about it in a very different way. So let's just zoom in on, on the construction industry for a moment. And although these figures are for the UK, I think they're going to be fairly uh, generic across um, most European markets. So for the UK, to give you an example, there is more than 400 million tonnes of material are delivered to UK construction sites. It's 400 million. Of that, 60 million goes directly to landfill because people overorder, products get damaged, and uh, they just go straight to landfill. I mean, that's just unbelievable waste. 60% of all materials in the UK, 60% of all materials in the UK are consumed by the construction and the operation of buildings. So you can see how buildings are fundamental if we want to deal with resources. You probably know this already, we, the, the, we in, the, in Europe, in the Western markets, uh, require two to three planets to sustain our way of life. In the US, it's probably five or six. In India, in China, it's probably less than half a planet. But there's a big imbalance between the West and, and uh, developing markets. But clearly, we cannot consume resources at this rate because there is going to be no replenishment over time. Twenty-five percent of all waste, this is a, U, a European Union figure, twenty-five percent of all waste is generated by the construction industry. And again, a lot of that material is made, we deliver to the job site, it's damaged or we over-order, it goes straight to landfill. And then in the UK, the figure for recycling in the uh, construction industry is about 40 percent, so there's still a long way to go. Some markets, maybe Germany is a little bit better, I don't know, but... Um, some markets, France would be even less, but it's still a long way to go. So you can see we still have a huge opportunity to deal with the way we manage resources. So we've got to think about designing buildings for disassembly and reuse, where we can reuse the materials again and again. So this is not me, but I think it's a, a, a fantastic way of thinking about this. It's not about just polluting less. It's fundamentally about redesigning, and particularly in our case, about redesigning buildings and building materials. So this is a really start to think about a different way. Instead of just reducing your impacts, you start at a different end and you start to redesign the way we live and our industrial system. So that's, that may not be very palatable. That's the issue. That's the problem we're facing. But on the other hand, here is a vision. It's a much more engaging vision. And when you think about not just waste, but waste is a resource. Um, and I use this a lot in the office, and everybody knows now, and everybody quotes it back at me. Just keep saying it to yourself. Waste is food. Waste is food for somebody in some process somewhere. So that's the first thing. The other thing is where all materials are safe. You can't reuse materials if you use a lot of toxic chemicals to make them in the first place. Even if they're locked up in the material, at the end of life, you want to recycle them, you're going to release those materials again. So you need materials that are safe. And we'll talk a bit about that later. It would be good to power everything from solar energy or renewable sources. And it would be good to replenish natural systems. In other words, we take out only what one planet can sustain. And here's the other thing. We've been told for decades that we should stop consuming. Eat less, take less uh, flights, drive less. Um, use less materials, waste less. Everybody tells us, do less. And what do we do? We completely ignore them. So this takes the thinking in a very different direction. It says, actually, consumption is not a problem. You can use things if you think about waste as food and if you think about materials that can be perpetually recycled and reused. Again, it's a different mindset. And I think this is a much more compelling vision than telling people to stop doing stuff. And I think when you start to do this, then you can start to see how, how we can uh, still have the buildings we want, 
but just be more responsible in the way we design them and use them. So now a little bit about circular economy and cradle-to-cradle -cradle design. And with, without going through the detail on, on, on the, on the uh, presentation, think of the circular economy as our industrial system. It's the big picture. And then cradle-to-cradle -cradle design is really the practical tools. In our case, how we design buildings or how we design products. You can talk about the circular economy, and this happens a lot in Brussels with the, uh, with the officials. Lots and lots of papers being produced around what, what is a circular economy, how Brussels can engage at the national level, blah, blah, blah. But fundamentally, something has to change. And you can use the principles of cradle-to-cradle -cradle design as a practical methodology to change. So the first thing I said to you is remember, waste is food. And the second thing, being less bad is not the same as being good. It's a fundamentally different way of thinking about our industrial system. So when we look at the circular economy principles, some of you will be familiar with the chart. It's from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Um, and I'm not going to go through the detail. We'll talk a bit, about, a bit about it later. But if you can keep materials in the economy for longer, you're going to get higher value. You're going to use fewer resources over time. So we need to do more with less. Waste as food, I keep talking about it. But to do that, the materials must have value. At the end of life, if the material has no value, then it will be going to landfill. So that's fundamental. You have to retain value in the materials. And we have to think of a whole system. So if, in our case, we're drawing materials from many places to make a ceiling product, we have to understand those systems. And then at the end of life, we have to understand how we deal with the ceiling products and keep them in the economy for longer. So some of the benefits, and these are figures from the European Commission, and there's a huge amount of publications if you look on EU websites, if you look on government websites. It's not just in Europe. Um, there are countries in South America now engaging with this. Uh, the Chinese are beginning to look at this whole idea of circular economy. And, it, and it's only my view, but if you, in two or three years' time, I think China will take the lead on circular economy. Why? Because it comes down to the health and well-being of their citizens. They cannot continue to burn oil, coal, and pollute their environment, dig things up, chop down trees. Um, it simply is not sustainable in China. So amazingly, China is also engaging around this. And you can see that uh, in the view of the European Commission, it's about creating jobs, it's about creating value, it's not just about stopping things. There are lots of built environment benefits, so now we're thinking about a construction and buildings. We can reduce construction costs if we're more thoughtful about the materials we use. We can increase the rental yields of buildings. Buildings with residual value, because the materials have value at the end of life, we can collaborate across the supply chain, which has been something we've been trying to do in construction for many years, and we can leave a positive architectural legacy. And although you could talk about this as circular economy, sustainability, sustainable buildings, this is very simple. It's a high quality building. You build a good building, all of these things will happen. So you start to think about high quality buildings. You're certainly gonna get people who want to work in them, so your rental yields are going to be good. Uh, you're going to have a positive architectural legacy and so on. We have lots of buildings like this already that we've built maybe 100 years ago. So I try and explain sustainable buildings as high-quality buildings. If you did think about that, then the, uh, all of these benefits flow through. So now we're coming more into cradle-to-cradle um, -cradle design. And these are the fundamental principles. So, for example, with circular design, you're, again, talk about this, eliminating the concept of waste and have waste as food. Material health, I already mentioned this. If you've got materials, chemicals, or substances you've used to make the product, even if they're locked in, at the end of life, if you want to reprocess or reuse them or recycle them, you're potentially going to release those toxics, toxins back into the environment. Design for disassembly and recovery, I talked about value chain collaboration, uh, and of course, importantly, need to be able to quantify the value, the business benefits 
of moving to cradle-to-cradle -cradle design. Again, some of you may be uh, familiar with this, but when you, you need to start having some practical tools about how you might design buildings <coughs> along the principles of circularity. And it's to think about building in layers. So you start with the idea of the structure. It's going to be there for 60 years, 120 years, maybe more, 150 or even longer. The people that make the materials for the structure <coughs> won't be there here when the building is changed or when the building is pulled down. So you've really got to think about how those materials are used for a very long time. Then start to think about the skin. So ease of refurbishment. How easy is it to change the skin? Potentially the cladding, the walls, those sorts of things. Because they're going to be changed much more frequently between 50 and 60 years. The services, so heating, ventilation, cooling, air conditioning and so on, maybe between 7 and 15 years. And then the space, so the chairs, the tables, the lights, and so on, are going to be replaced more frequently, or, or even other things like printers, photocopiers, laptops, anything else. So you start to think about buildings, not just as, a, as one product, but as a series of different layers. And that makes it much easier to start to think about how you can design along the principles of circularity. This is incredibly difficult, so don't start here. But if you can start somewhere around here, and certainly with the materials that are replaced very frequently, then you can start building along the lines of, uh, along the principles of circularity. You will never get a complete circular or cradle-to-cradle -cradle building in one go. You have to make steps. And I think this is a very, very good way to think about designing buildings. Just quickly back to the nutrient cycles. Biological nutrients, they're relatively straightforward. They can be uh, biologically uh, degraded. And then for us, with a ceiling system, for example, it's a technical nutrient, as is a chair or a floor or a wall or a, or a walling system, where you need to be able to disassemble, bring the materials back for reuse, recycling, uh, repurposing, maybe in somebody else's production process. So it's the idea of uh, keeping all of these things in the economy. And to generate value, you need to think about how, during its lifetime, a product could be uh, potentially a service. Uh, a very good example, we did this years ago, of course, photocopiers. 20 years ago, we would buy a photocopier for an office. Now, we rent them. Today, it's crazy. We still buy laptops. Why? Why don't we rent them? So already, we can begin to see these models exist. Lighting is a very good example. Philips, you know Philips, uh, Dutch uh, lighting manufacturer, they sell lux. They don't sell the light fitting. The light fitting stays the property of Philips. They sell what the light does, which is lux. And they make a contract with the building, uh, building users. They guarantee a certain lux level for the life of the building, or for a contract, five years, ten years. They will maintain the lights, they will replace them, they will replace the bulbs. But the user is buying a service. So that's a rather good way of thinking about how you can retain value in your products. Again, four, five, ten years ago, Philips would sell the light, finish. It's not their problem. Now they retain ownership of the lamp and the fitting, and they sell the benefit of the product, which is Lux. So it gives you an idea. And we're already thinking about how we might be able to do this in Armstrong with ceilings. I'm going to jump over this and speed up a little bit. The other thing I want to talk about is it's all very well to think about construction and buildings and the building materials that you choose, but what is the impact on the people in the building? And I think this is going to be a key way in which we can engage people around cradle-to-cradle -cradle design. We all know this. We must have been in many, many buildings where these things happen. We leave at the end of the day with a headache or fatigue or eye strain and as the afternoon goes on our productivity drops, we feel tired and so on. And a lot of that comes simply down to good design. <coughs> and, and, we, and we've seen all of these things. So and I think how you design interiors particularly and the materials that you choose are fundamental to the way that people operate and are productive in buildings. So we're now seeing more and more of a focus on people in buildings 
and not just examining all the time the products and the embodied energy and the environmental performance of the product. It's about its impact on the people in the building. So, lovely theory, great ideas, fantastic vision. Is anybody doing anything about it? I'm going to talk a little bit more about the manufacturing. There is a lot of work going on with clients and investors, the design community, uh, contractors um, and the engineering community and I have pages and pages of notes which we don't have time to look at today but I was surprised how many organizations in these areas are already taking an interest so it's beginning to grow a little bit in the construction industry um, and you'll see that in the manufacturing sector there's already a lot of activity here So for the manufacturers, and now this is where I can talk about Armstrong and our experience, we've adopted the cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified product standard because in, in, a, in a way this is a very quick shorthand, quickly explains the performance of our products to people who are choosing our products. And we want to think that eventually our sealing systems can be a positive force for people, uh, economy and the planet, and we're not simply taking resources from the planet all the time. So let me just take you through this, and I know some of you here in the audience are familiar with this. But again, it's back to this idea. Being less bad is not the same as being good. And we know in Armstrong, I don't know where we are, somewhere along the bottom, maybe one or two things we do are positive and they're green. Maybe a number of things we do are still negative. But we have to start to move. And it will take us a long time, but we have to start somewhere. And this is the ingredients of, of the product. So the first thing we did several years ago now, four or five years ago, we looked at what is in our material, how do we make our ceilings, and we start to remove the bad bits, and we start to be more positive over time. So that's kind of the idea of continuous improvement. For many companies, they get a, an environmental certification, they get the stamp, and then they finish and they move on. You can't do that with cradle to cradle. You have to keep innovating and keep improving your product performance. Again, it comes back to these two guys, Michael Bromgart and William McDonough. Again, I know a number of you are familiar with the same thing. Being less bad is not the same as being good. So the cradle to cradle product standard has these five components. So it's a very broad, it's a very holistic approach to um, certification. So you look at the material health, I talked about this already, select safe and healthy materials and you have to go down to 100 parts per million. So really a very very small, so if you take something as simple as white paint, you think well what if white paint, it's just, I don't know, it's white and it's water and mix it together. There are probably 10 or 12 individual ingredients just in white paint and all of those will have a chemical number and those chemicals will have an analysis of how they interact with our ecosystem. So this is really a very thorough process. Material reutilization. Can your product be reutilized at end of life? So you're eliminating the concept of waste. How much power do you use? Where does it come from? How much water do you use? What is the quality of the water when it leaves your factory? It may be perfectly safe, but it's not the same as the quality of the water when it came into your factory. So you need, to, you need to change the way you manage water. And then the last one looks at how we as a company behave around social fairness, so, so in our supply chain and in our factories. So you can see, put all that together and you come up with um, a, a more a holistic view <coughs> of um, sustainable products. Armstrong, or is that based on the cradle-to-cradle? Cradle, uh, that's based on, that's the cradle-to-cradle cradle five criteria, mm -hmm. yeah. And you can imagine there's a product standard that thick, and you have to go through the process. And this is what it covers, so it deals with your supply chain, so all of the materials coming into your plant, you have to go back up the supply chain and look at all that stuff coming in. Believe me, that's tough. Particularly with supply chains for materials that might come from many different sources all over the world. The, pre the certification also looks at the manufacturing stage. They look at exactly everything we do to make the ceiling. 
it takes a good look at the end of life, not so much the in-use phase, and I think that will come over time, but the certification standard at the moment, as you can see, covers those. So it's uh, something very much for the manufacturers to embrace. It's about continuous improvement, I mentioned, moving from basic all the way through to platinum, and the levels, it's very transparent, and you can see exactly what you need to do to move to the le next level. Recertification every two years. So you can't do nothing. So when you see manufacturers with certification around cradle to cradle, you know that they are improving their product and their processes. Otherwise, no certification. So this would be a typical scorecard. And you can see this is not Armstrong. I just picked this one from uh, the, the uh, Institute. On this one, they get a very high rating for the material health, and they get a very low one for the renewable energy and carbon management. And what that means is that their overall certification level is bronze at the lowest level. But what's really nice about this is they can see, whoever this manufacturer is, they can see very clearly they now need to work a lot on their energy management and their carbon emissions. They can also do some work on recycling and on their management of water. So real transparency about how you make progress. And of course, if you do make progress, you're rewarded with a higher level of certification. So you can see it's a very practical tool. Now, we're not the only people. There'll be a lot of brands on here that you recognize. If you look at the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute, which has a product <coughs> directory, I was told earlier this week that there are over 8,000 products now certified. They are from across industry, everywhere, across our economy. So um, I know that CNA, the retailer, has uh, certified a T-shirt, for example, and now is beginning to certify more, uh, uh, more cotton uh, clothing. There are, I don't think I can see any here, but there are uh, detergents, cosmetics, shoes, Puma, for example. Um, there are building materials. There's office furniture. And that's what I like about the Cradle to Cradle product standard. It's not just for a building product. It could be for anything. And that means that as consumers, we're going to see the C to C logo appear more and more on products we use every day. And I think that will then help to, to generate more interest in the uh, building environment. There are some green building rating tools. Some of you may be familiar with them. LEED, uh, that is the US Green Building Council, but of course it's all over Europe. BRIAM uh, NL in the Netherlands. These systems already give you credits if you choose cradle-to-cradle -cradle products. The one in the middle is for the UK. Also DGNB, which is the German system, also gives you a credit for uh, choosing cradle-to-cradle -cradle products. And there are lots of, again, lots of case studies. I'm going to go a little bit quickly so we don't run out of time. Um, this one is a very good example. ABN AMRO, the Dutch bank. Uh, this is actually a bank. They call it a pavilion, but it's like a pop-up bank. Um, and they reckon with the design, and I said this earlier, you cannot create a whole building along the principles of cradle to cradle in one go. You have to think about this over time. That they reckon that 50% of the materials in that building have a value at the end of life, a second use. And we work with them on this project. This is an example of us. This is Google in Amsterdam. We diverted all of that material from landfill. We took the ceilings back. We also then installed a cradle-to-cradle -cradle product. So a nice circular approach of renovating the Google uh, office in Amsterdam. We're doing some more work with them. Here's another case study uh, from Armstrong. Again, I won't go through the details, but um, I'll show you in a minute on the, on the recycling. But if you, take, um, if you recycle ceilings rather than putting in landfill, you're saving a lot on disposal costs, and that's where the business case comes in. And here's the, uh, here's the slide on the recycling program. Very simple. You can see what happens. You take them down. You put them on a pallet. You stick them in a truck. You take them back to our plant, and we make a new ceiling tile from the old ceiling tile. And that whole process, once you've got it on the pallet, is free. So we'll take the truck to the site, bring it back, and recycle. No minimum quantities. We have some partnerships with distributors in selected markets. We will recycle our competitors' tiles, building rating tools, and the contractor can say if that's in euros, it's probably a little bit more today. You can see there's a real business case to try and encourage the uptake of recycling. 
Another thing that you'll see more and more coming through is the idea of building uh, of material passports. So think of a building product that has attached to it, electronically, details about what's in it, how you use it, how you design for disassembly, which I can't spell, and how you design for next use. So all of these materials in this building, nobody knows where they come from, nobody knows if they can be recycled, nobody knows what the value is. So if you had attached to them, a material passport, then this could help significantly. And a one way of doing that is through BIM objects. And BIM is something that's been growing very rapidly in the construction sector. So, to summarize, the making of things is destructive. We don't have a pollution problem. We have to think about this in a different way. It's a design problem. The vision is safe, healthy and, uh, uh, healthy and endlessly reusable materials. Waste is food. The cradle-to-cradle -cradle design is designing buildings for disassembly and reuse. Think of buildings as material banks. And then the cradle-to-cradle -cradle product standard is a certification. It's verifying positive materials for circular systems. So you know if you choose a C2C certified product, that the in material ingredients are safe for reuse again and again. And that's it. Sorry, a very quick run through, but uh, I hope that gave you an overview of C2C and, and circular design. And are there any questions? Uh, is there only a certification for a specific product, or can you be certified as a company? Only for product. Only for There's product. no certification for a company. Not yet. So Armstrong Florian also working with the same... Um, Armstrong, we're, we're, we're now separate. Okay. And mm -hmm. it's a good question. I think in Germany, I did hear that Armstrong Florian was doing some work around C2C. Um, what's interesting is many countries now, Germany, the Netherlands, France, UK, Spain, as I said, South America, China, unbelievable, all beginning now to come together around this idea. The Cradle to Cradle brand is now being marketed by the US Green Building Council. So I think we're going to see in the US, and if something starts big in the US, it tends to go big everywhere. And also, have you heard of the Eleanor MacArthur Foundation, the circular economy? They've also now made arrangements to promote the, so circular economy is the big stuff, and then the Cradle to Cradle is the practical tool. And now the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has joined forces together. So I think now we're beginning to see some real energy behind C2C. Uh, one of the earlier slides said you, you showed that the production cost was lower yes. uh, in this system. And uh, I, could you elaborate on that? How, how, how come? Because the materials are. It's, yeah, it's tougher with uh, recycled materials being cheaper. For us, it makes sense because the value of the material we recover from the market is lower than buying virgin raw material. So, and also, the amount of energy needed to make the finished ceiling product is lower. We use less water, we use less energy, we use less virgin material. So purely in our case, it can help keep the cost down. Of course, we have some transportation costs, but it's on balance. So that's purely for Armstrong okay. uh, that we're able to. But you're right, recycling is not automatically the right answer. And that's partly because the value of the material is very low, or it's got, you have to do too much work to it, processing, to use it again. And that's why I think it's not so much about let's just recycle more, it's about let's redesign products and think about them in a different way. You have to kind of start to build that as you decrease the other one. Yes, yeah. And this is not going to happen overnight, sure. You know, but for us, this is a business opportunity. It's a commercial opportunity. Yes, we want to save the planet, but it has to be a good business logic. And we can see the business logic. The cost of certification, how does it work? Um, you pay, I, I'm going to say, let's say for a ceiling tile, something very simple that we're sitting under now, 5,000 euros. That's it. 
um, for the certification process. So you have to submit all of the data around how you make it, your supply chain, the ingredients down to 100 parts per million, how you behave as a business. And it, it takes, I've just started now for the recertification that has to be finished in July. So it's a very thorough process. It takes a lot of discussion with, these, with the assessors. But for one product, it would be for us about 5,000 euros. It's relatively low. Is that every other year? Every, time every two years, yeah. yes. It's a, little, it's a little bit less on the recertification um, because, of course, they're, they're tend to be reviewing what you've done rather than starting from the very beginning. But, again, the business case. Um, in, in the Netherlands, we were asked for cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified product. So the cost was very small compared to the commercial advantage uh, that we could see in the market. And now, because our products are very similar, the uh, assessor said, hey, look, come on. We could certify a whole plant because more or less what you do, it's only maybe a difference in thickness, maybe a difference in the edge. So we've learned over time how to be a little bit more creative in, in the way we do the certification. Okay, that's well, great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you.